Good morning, everyone, and welcome to my lecture recital on analysis and performance interpretation of Brahms' Cello Sonata Number no. One in E Minor, Opus Thirty Eight. First, let's talk about the composer. The composer is Johannes Brahms. He was born in Hamburg, the seventh of May, eighteen thirty-three, and died in Vienna, third of April, eighteen ninety-seven. He is a German composer and pianist of the Romantic period. He composed many pieces like symphonies, concerto, chamber music, piano works, and choral, choral compositions. His style of music is a combination of lyrical and intellectual as a contrast to the new German school. Next, let's talk about the piece. Cello Sonata No. 1 in E minor, Opus 38, was composed during the period of 1862 to 1865. Brahms begins his writing in early 1862, but stopped writing the piece in June, where he has already written most of the pieces, but waited three years later when he finally finished the whole piece and finished the finale. Brown's attention was distracted to the string quintet in F minor and a new job post. This piece was dedicated to Josef Gensbacher, who was his supporter and an amateur cellist at that time. It was first publicly performed in 1867, played by Moritz Kant and Hans von Bülow and was published in 1866. The structure of the piece begins with a sonata form first movement, of the first movement, with chordal accompaniment supporting the cello melody, first theme. The second theme is a forte and it comprised of an arpeggio chord. The exposition section ends with a soft and lyrical melody. And in development, the motives from both of the themes are expanded, while the recapitulation returns to the main themes, and the quota modulated into major at the end. The second movement is the allegretto, quasi, minuetto, and trio. The minuetto is in a minuet form, and it begins with a light dance feel in a minor which is followed by a couple of variants and ends with the cello playing the pizzicato. Trio is drastically different from the minuet with a more lyrical melody. The trio also contains some qualities of music by Schumann. With the ending of trio not resolving, it returns back to the minuet. Lastly, the third movement that is the allegro, which is also written as a fugue. The piano introduces the subject in bass register with great power, which is then followed by the cello and later in the treble register of the piano. This subject has uses different fugal techniques like inversion and strato. This is a chart showing some of the elements of each movement. Some of the elements that are noted is the rhythmic features that Brahms has used in the movement. For example, the first movement uses strato. The second movement, he has used hemiola in the piece. And the third movement, he also uses strato and three against two. I have picked three excerpts in this piece and these, piece, uh, these three excerpts has all have something in common, which is that Brahms uses them as a way to increase tension and as a way to release. The first excerpt is from the first movement, bar 54 to 61. This is the first time Brahms has introduced the second subject and have a sort of small climax giving us a glimpse of the real climax afterward. The excerpt is in the four bar phrases, 
and there is a repeated phrasing on the cello and piano part, in which they are played like a strato phrase, where cello plays first and piano follows closely, like repeating with cello part just the. Even though the cello stayed at the same range, the piano both lines went from middle range in bar 55 to one octave lower and higher in the third beat of bar 55 to 57. Starting from bar 58, the second subject enters with similar pattern again, also using strato. The cello is playing in the same melody repeatedly, with the last one finally goes into the small climax in bar 60, with a wide jump in bar 61. That's the piece high point for cello. On the other hand, the piano follows the cello's melody with a contrary motion like in a bar 56 to 60, reaching the small climax. Having a richer texture with octaves and simple chordal accompaniment going stepwise downward while the cello going upward. This creates a wider range. The piano bass line also plays in a strato in accompaniment to the cello melody line, which is also in a chromatic octave. The second excerpt I chose is from the second movement, bar 100 to 108, which is the later part of the trio. The excerpt is in a four bar phrase as well and begins with a wide range of arpeggios melody in cello, with the piano still playing the remnant of main subject of trio, bringing us into the climax of climax between bar 101 to 103. In these bars, cello is playing in a stepwise pattern with a turn-like melody, having the feeling of wanting more for the eventual release of the climax. The piano also supports this action with a contrary motion of arpeggios in contrast of the cello melody, going downward and creating an even wider range. However, when in bar 103, finally reaching the climax, it just stayed for a little, really short time before coming back down, which continued the climbing again in the exact same melody line as in bar 101 and 102, giving the feeling of not satisfied and not enough for the short time of release. In bar 104 to 106, it's the set repeating of phrase again, with the 107 reaching climax the second time, which finally calmed down with a stepwise inverted that turn going down. The third excerpt I chose is from the third movement, bar 111 to 119, we can see that in bar 111 to 12, the melody in cello is a jump from high to low repeatedly with different interval. The piano also follows the same pattern with bass line having a strato back pattern with chord accompaniment, which continue till bar 114. The piano accompaniment also widens the range by lowering the bass in each chord. The cello melody changes in the third beat of bar 112 to 114, inverting the pattern going from low to high, which bar 113 and 14 are the same notes repeating, creating the anticipation as piano chordal accompaniment going lower and lower. In bar 115 to 119 is the climax which cello and piano playing similar, with the climax placing the second beat, and coming down with an up and down motion. You can see that from the mouse, it's like going a hill and going back up. Which then, repeat the phrase again, just like in excerpt two, when in bar 115 to 122, which is the decrease of tension. Brahms also uses a pedal point throughout with piano bass line playing the B in an octave. This creates a feeling of continuity 
as it is not resolved until in bar 123, with a color change in both dynamics and the melody line. With different kinds of interpretations, it is important to select carefully on which player as reference to your playing, since some people might exaggerate or put in their own twist or characteristic on the music itself. Comparing different kinds of players also helps me as a player to identify what elements are important when I am playing a piece composed by Brahms, as well as some of the things that I should not do based on my current level of playing. I have used this recording of three players for the comparison, which are Jacqueline Dupre, Yo-Yo Ma, and Miss Chamaisky. First of all, this is also part of the excerpt one I just showed. This is the first movement of bar 46 to 65. They all have a little bit different on how they build the tension as well as the phrases before that. In Jacqueline Dupre's version, in bar 46, the first four bars she started in around mezzo 40, and having a color change in bar 50, which she continued to crescendo and with more vibrato, while Vishamayski started with 40 already, but when the color change comes, he softened it and start crescendo slowly again. For Yoyoma, he started with mezzo forte, a crescendo throughout, with no significant color change on the same place. I'm going to demonstrate two of them, which is the Jacqueline Dupre's one and my Mr. Maisky one. The first time will be Jacqueline Dupre's, and the second time will be Mr. Maisky. After that, on bar 58 to 65, Maisky played faster at first on bar 58 and rushes to bar 61, where he slowed down for the high B and slowly increased the speed again back to the tempo. He creates a more dramatic effect for the changes and can present more emotion onto his play. For Dupre, she stretched the opening of bar 58 and proceed to play faster than reach for the high B. She also has a little bit of rubato, but the changes is not as dramatic as my skill. As for Yoyoma, he plays a more subtle version compared to the other two, with just a slight rubato in the beginning of bar 58, as well as for the phrase of the high B. I'm going to demonstrate again for the Jacqueline Dupre's version and the Mr. Maisky version.
For this place, I would follow the score playing bar 46 in forte. When reaching bar 50, I would play a little bit of rubato with softer dynamics and even more rubato to make the color change stand out more, which in a case is similar to Yo-Yo Ma's interpretation. After that, I would play in tempo until bar 57. The beginning of bar 58, I would play in a slower tempo, just like just for the first beat, and then proceed and play faster, like jerking the prayers, which have a bit of emphasis on bar 63's F note. Thank you for listening to my lectures. Uh, please enjoy my performance on the later time. Thank you.
Thank you. 